This was the first year of the Valdez Stoll competition in Alaska. And Doug Keller and myself, Greg Miller, flew from the Pacific Northwest all the way to Valdez in our two airplanes. This is how it's done in 2021. Yeah, I might be an old guy, but I think there should be some kind of requirement that makes you have to fly your airplane to these competitions. If you can't fly your airplane to the competition, then I think you should be excluded from it. That's just my personal opinion. Either that or have a special class for airplanes that are just trailered in. You can see that these lightweight competition airplanes will not hold up to the rugged off-airport beatings that we put them through. As described by Kirk and Cole, respectively, utilize momentum to gain that edge required to attain flying speed. You're going to get 90 degrees of the runway and use a little bit of acceleration this way to make a plane go ahead and take off because we've got such a short spot we can't do it all so we carry a little bit of speed and make a 90 degree turn and that's what uh, one of my guys that I do. The guys that I looked up to when I was learning off airport are a group of guys that do it for a living and do it in all conditions and they're the real stole pilots, the real bush pilots of Alaska. Kirk takes a little longer run, I do, and uh, he can get a little more uh, stripped that way, because that's what the problem is. The washout at the end, you're just really shortened up. So, and what I like to do is I kind of stay in one spot, and uh, I accelerate out and do my turn, but all the time I'm letting my engine turn up. So I'm at max, engines at max turn up, time I get straight with my runway. So I don't have to sit there, I'm, and I'm moving. See, where you sit there normally and hold your brakes and then let go, Okay, I'm getting more forward speed by starting this way, and then in my turn, I'm moving all the time. Then when I come out here, I'm already rolling, and my engine's already peeking out. These are a few short segments from a VHS tape called Super Cub Hardcore 2, and that's what got me actually interested in off-airport flying and what I could do with my airplane in the off-airport environment. These techniques are very demanding of the pilot in that he must have a very good feel as to how the airplane is loaded. Specifically, how much strain to put on the inside gear leg, how much brake to apply to that gear on the inside of the turn, and an acute understanding of the moment arm to which a tail dragger pilot must pay attention while executing these maneuvers. This is truly a one-way airstrip. Once one is committed to landing, there is no alternative. The challenging approach to the airstrip at an altitude of approximately 5,700 feet requires passing through a potential wind funnel where air currents must be carefully felt out. Higher altitude trial passes through this area are requisite. Steeply rising terrain on all quadrants eliminates the go-around option. The approach is exacerbated by the intimidating terrain which includes entering the basin at low speed and low altitude over a 100-foot waterfall. The really neat thing for me is I've become friends with Kirk Ellis and spend some time out there at the lodge and in that area, and so I know exactly where this spot is. These places aren't landed just for fun. They actually haul sheep hunters Other into Other complications them. include moving the airplane laterally to the right, then carefully with minimal rudder deflection at low airspeed, precisely lining up with a 600-foot landing area, conveniently situated atop a four-foot cut bank above the creek. And, oh yes, one must avoid a large boulder to the left of the airplane wing. The rollout area terminates at a mountain which rises another 3,000 feet above the landing area itself. The main thing there is to watch your airspeed. Because when, you, when your airplane's slow like that, and you start um, trying to move it one way or the other, especially with rudder control like that, that's, that's a good way to stall it and spin it. So you want to, want to be careful. You want to keep enough forward speed going and get the airplane where it needs to be and then get your speed uh, led on down. If you start slowing it way down, way back, before we had to make the turn over to the runway, right. and then start kicking it around, well, you're asking for trouble. And don't be afraid to use a little aileron to get it around there either. Watch your wing, don't let it, let it you know, dip a whole bunch, but it don't hurt to put a little in there. 
a little rudder and uh, it's you, you got to be careful because too much cross control gets you in trouble but you gotta gotta just think it out ahead of time you know get it down there keep the airplane moving forward the time and then get everything straight again and when you're when you're bleeding off before you stall try this approach to landing several times a day under widely varying load conditions with wind and temperature fluctuations and add to that the possibility of sheep or caribou strolling out on what one might laughingly refer to as a runway and you can see that people like the Alice's do indeed earn their pay. After a brief repose in this secluded mountain hideaway, we prepare to venture forth to our next location. While a top performing Super Cub is capable of amazingly short takeoffs, utilizing the entire available airstrip to achieve safe flying speed is a safety issue of paramount concern, a point on which all three Ellis's are in unanimous agreement. Even if it's a little short, we know two thirds of the way down the strip whether or not that airplane is going to perform. There's no feeling like it in the world but when you know halfway down the airport that it's going to fly. It's beautiful and then you're very casual after that. You let her thunder down another 100 or 200 feet to make it look good. When you're hauling people and all, and you've got usable strip, well, use all of your usable strip. You know, sure, the airplane might fly at a couple of hundred feet or whatever, but don't go jerking it off, especially if you've got a little bit of a gusty day or a little bit of turbulence, and it might settle back with you. It might, wind might push you off to the side and might settle in a rock. So go ahead and get good flying speed, get good control of your airplane. You know, it's just a safer all around thing to do, just a good thing to remember. Something that you need to master is the directional control. You've got to be able to put the airplane on the ground and run it down the rocky runway. Be able to keep that airplane on the ground and keep control of it. Because a lot of people will get going and then they begin to lose control of the plane a little bit. So then they, they haul it off with minimum controllable airspeed. We've seen accidents from that. There's so much sage advice in this Super Cub Hardcore video too that uh, I highly recommend picking it up if you're interested in real off airport flying and not just stole competitions. Which brings me to my own off airport flying and what I do with my airplane. I use it for camping, hunting, fishing, exploring. This particular day I was up to explore for places for my daughter and I to go camp and I brought a friend with his airplane. Unfortunately, he snapped his tailwheel off trying to get out of this place. That's what I'm doing here is I'm back looking for the tailwheel. I didn't realize he had snapped it off when he left, so he lands on a sandbar and uh, I go down and drop his father-in-law off on the sandbar because he was worried about getting his father-in-law out of the spot. So he had his own um, worries to begin with about whether he had enough room to get out of there and he used it all anyway snapped the tailwheel off at the shaft the tailwheel was other than that intact so landed on this big sandbar here put a skid on it so he could get back home and away he went I had planned on spending the day up there anyway, whether it was by myself or with my friend. And so I went to the place that I had cleared out a few weeks earlier. I had done that with my Super Cub, and now I'm landing it with Bushwhacker for the first time since I've cleared it out. And here's the difference between stole competitions and the real world. Stole competitions on asphalt or grass. What are the repercussions? Not much. Come up short here, you take the gear off the airplane. And if you come up long, you'll actually run out of space. You'll either end up in the washout off on your right, or you'll just be in the alders at the end. Try to go around, you might stall it in the turn.
I launch my drone from Eagles Point right here, and I fly it up river and down river. I love the perspective you get with a drone. You can slow it down, whereas with an airplane you're always moving quite a bit faster. This gives you more of the perspective of a helicopter with a million dollar Cineflex camera mounted to it. Pretty impressive what they can do now. It was pretty funny. I ended up at this fishing hole and I was like, for sure I'd pull a pretty nice trout out of here and nothing, nothing, nothing. I don't know. I'd thrown the fly out like I think three or four times. And then all of a sudden this river otter pulls out this fairly nice fish onto the other side of the bank and starts munching away on it. Pretty soon his mate or buddy showed up and they, uh, stayed there and ate for a little bit until they got irritated by the drone. I followed them up river on foot and I actually filmed them a few times with the GoPro but it's such a far off perspective that it doesn't really give you much good footage. It was interesting though to me that they were super curious and they wanted to keep me in sight but every once in a while they would swim up river and then they'd turn around and they'd come back and check me out and that went on for quite a ways. This is actually the end of the runway that I touched down on right here. You can see my tire marks. 